family was musical. My grandfather was a composer. Uh, all four grandparents were musical. They either sang or played. Uh, my parents could both read music. My brother's a musician. Um, I had an uncle who was a songwriter, uh, an aunt who was a pianist. So my family was just it was music. And so there wasn't a lot of choice as to what I was going to do. Even though as a kid I didn't want to become a composer, that wasn't on my list at all. I, I was really taken with animation. That's what I thought I was going to do. Good thing I didn't become an animator because I've seen the animators and they're a lot better than I was. My big family um, was all part of the Salvation Army, which is a very musical organization. And so you have to learn to play a brass instrument. So at the same time I learned to play piano, I learned to play trumpet. I never liked it, but I, piano was really my instrument. My brother's a trombone player. Um, and over the years, I studied music, mostly piano, and got to be a good reader, a really good reader. And I got to the point where I could play just about anything. I mean, I wasn't Horowitz, but I could play anything well enough to get through it and see what it was. And I think my sight reading skills were improved because I just wanted to see what the music was. So I'd read and read and read and read and read. Around the time I got into college, um, I didn't want to take piano anymore. And I took composition because I really, frankly, didn't know what to do. And I figured I could take composition because I didn't know too much about it. And I would, um, for the time that I was spent in college, I might find something that I really liked to do. I never found it, so I got a degree in composition. And um, around the same time, decided to go into the movies because I decided as a composer, the kind of music that I really wanted to write was the kind of music that would affect people emotionally. And so over the years, that's really been the, the um, thing that's brought me back to music, how to write music that is audience oriented and emotional and listenable without um, without pandering and writing down and all stuff. Well when you write in television and, and movies you learn to write on demand because that's part of it. So um, so I started in television working at CBS television and then went freelance, did a ton of series like Dallas and my first my first credit is on Gunsmoke and I think the last year of Gunsmoke, not the first year. Um, Gunsmoke, Hawaii Five-O, Dallas, Quincy, How the West Was Won, lots and lots and lots and lots of episodes. And I was really fortunate to get a lot of work very quickly. So I got a lot of experience writing, just you, because as a composer, you just need to practice. So you write and write and write. So the television guys, I think, who can do that actually have the edge. Um, like guys like Sean Callery, who does 24. I mean, he's, he's very good, but he gets a lot of practice, you know. And then you see some guys who are just starting, and they need more practice. You know? So by the time I got into the features, um, I had a lot of stuff behind me. That was a real development period for you, right? I mean, working um, with Mort Stevens and, and... Yeah, well, working at CBS was a development period for me. <laughs> but not always as a composer. I mean, first of all, I was not hired to be a composer. I was hired to be an assistant music supervisor, which actually meant to be an assistant cue picker which is what we called it, a cue selector. Uh, in so the go, department, go back into the libraries? and Yeah, you go back yeah. in the libraries. And actually, it was the same department Jerry Goldsmith started in. Exactly the same department, same people, except he started about 10 years before I did working in radio. But we both did the same kind of work. We had records, and, and we would have shows, and, and for cues, we'd find them on pre-existent music, on libraries. Um, and little by little, you know, as, as we would have a show that let's say we had all the music for it on library except for let's say two cues or three cues one of the supervisors if they were a composer would compose it and then we'd tack that on the end of somebody else's session and little by little you know you'd start to write and that's how I started to write my first my first cues were for a show that Mort Stevens was doing called Men at Law I did three cues and that was it I was now a film composer it took me a long time to get the next three cues but but they again were just a couple of cues and so we did these partial scores. But occasionally I got to write episodes. So when I got my first Emmy nomination, it was for an episode of Hawaii Five-0 that I did at CBS while I was still... But I did that on my own time. I did it in the evenings. I did it on the weekends. My real job was, as a music supervisor, to be responsible for the music that went into a given series. So for that, we hired other composers. Like, I worked a lot with Jerry Fielding. Jerry would come in and work on a comedy series, like Governor and J.J. was one that I worked on. Um, or the Andros Targets was another one where we had lots of composers come in. I met Basil Polidorus uh, as a composer who we hired. He was just young, he was just starting out. He was the same age as I was. We were in the same year at school at USC, but didn't meet each other until we got to CBS. Um, and I think I was able to get him onto the Andros Targets, um, or Spencer's Pilots or some 
Arcane series. So as a result, I went to recording sessions, I went to dubbing sessions, um, I knew the library both as discs and as scores. Uh, Jerry Immel, who wrote the Dallas theme, was the copyist there, the supervising copyist when I started CBS, and then left CBS while I was still there to go on and become a composer. I sometimes did a little bit of copying just to make a little bit of extra cash. Now at the same time I was at CBS, they decided to go into the motion picture business. So they were actually producing uh, motion pictures like um, Little Big Man, um, I can't remember, but they had substantial pictures, and they hired big composers. So I could look in on scores by Jerry Goldsmith or, or Lalo Schifrin or Michelle Legrand or Henry Mancini and, and um, all these guys, they were hiring you know, the best composers. So that, little by little I started to meet these guys from a distance. You know, I was rather shy because, oh, these are you know, big guys. Yeah. But, um, but I could also look at their scores and I could see what they were doing. And it was, like, it was interesting to, to see a score of John Williams, his original sketch, and compare it to what um, Herb Spencer had done in an orchestration. You know, oh, gee, this is, I mean, it's all there in John's notes, but Herb would add this and would tweak that. And all, you know, he wasn't writing music, but he was just orchestrating. And I learned a lot just by looking at the scores. And Jerry Immel and I would sit there and we would go through scores either before or after a, a session. Before a session saying, gee, I wonder how this is going to turn out. And then after hearing how it turned out, we'd go through the scores again and we'd point out things to each other. And I mean, it was, it, for that way, it was really an invaluable lesson. And then eventually I became manager of the department and eventually assistant director of music for CBS and would have probably become director of music, but by that time, had enough. You know, I mean, well, we're it, talking how many years? Ten, I was there for 10 years. Two, two years, actually probably eight years. Two years I was in the Army. I got drafted and spent, um, spent a year and a half at... Fort Ord, Monterey, and then a half a year in Italy, where my oldest girl was born. So I had an okay time in those two years. But the time at CBS was interesting because I had a sense of contracts, I had a sense of licensing, I had a sense of management. I was even on a um, union negotiation one time on the F AF of M, except that I was with the producers, you know, and I had the musicians on the other side. So I got a sense of... of um, how people negotiated and what they were negotiating for. When I was part of the producers, I understood why they didn't want to pay ASCAP so much money, you know. And I and now being with ASCAP, I can understand why ASCAP wants more money, you know. I mean that kind of stuff. And I would say that what I actually got at CBS was a really great overview of what the business was, but specifically television. It didn't entirely prepare me for freelancing because once I started freelancing, I got busy really fast. And then it was sort of like 24-7 for a period of about seven months of just writing, 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 writing. And um, working on deadlines and the insecurity that that all brings. But, it, you know, it turned out okay. And years later, I had a technique and a career. Did you feel like at any given time, this is when, like, that, the style came about? Uh, My style? Or, yeah. I don't even know what my style is. Really? Whatever, what, yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> but whatever it is, my kids can identify it. I've been able to identify it since they were little kids. I think everybody know. can identify it except I you. I guess everybody, everybody except me. Um, I don't have a style. I can write any style. <laughs> um, you mentioned Mort Stevens. Mort Stevens was the director of music when I worked at CBS. The first scoring session I ever went to after working for CBS was a score of Mort's, which was a score he had done for Gunsmoke. Now, as I said, I grew up in the Salvation Army, which is all brass. So I thought I knew something about brass. It's based on the English brass band style. And I had that well under my head. And there's a lot of sophistication in the music and in the playing. But I never heard brass music like the way Mort did it. He had six trombones, six horns, six trumpets for an episode called Major Glory. You remember that? And I just, I never heard any, I just never heard, I'd never heard so much dramatic music. I never heard so much specific music. I never heard horns filled out like that. I never heard the sounds like that. And I remember sitting on the stage going, geez, I mean, what? Is, it just wham, right in my face, you know? And then a year or two later, being able to go on the stage and hearing Jerry Goldsmith do something, um, I remember we were all taken, a couple of years later, he did the reincarnation of Peter Proud. On the stage, which was what became Todd A.O., but on that huge stage that CBS had, it was one of the most beautiful sounds I ever heard in my life, that orchestra on the stage. It was so beautiful. The orchestration was just so seraphic. 
So I'm, and it was really funny because there were a bunch of us who went down from the department. Mort got very depressed because, <laughs> like, he and Jerry had been together at Universal, and you know, Mort went, "Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah." But I got very excited. I thought, "Man, if I just keep writing, if I just keep working, maybe I can do that too. You know, maybe I can get that kind of a sound." And and you listen to it, you think, "Oh, Jerry's been studying Scriabin. Oh, oh, he's been studying Debussy. Oh, you know." And then you go back and you look at his sources to see what he was. But it, those kind of things were invaluable. Or. Um, walking on the stage tonight with Quincy Jones, which had a completely different way of working. You know, he'd have all his keyboards out and he had his guys and he improvises this and improvises that and talks out a lot of his score and, and I mean, the way he deals with everything, the way everybody dealt with people, the way they dealt with directors and producers. To come around all that was, was very interesting and very useful as I got older as well. Not that I always did it well, but I had a lot of people to look at and see how they all did it differently. And my style, whatever that is, partly came from Mort, um, dramatically, and then I had to tone that back because Mort always had sort of a melodramatic, bigger than life version, you know, of doing it. 25 years later or more, I was a supervising composer on Tiny Toons, <coughs> Tiny Toon Adventures. And um, Mort wasn't doing so much by that time. So my job was to hire composers who could do that sort of style. And I thought of Mort, so I called up Mort, and of course he jumped for it because it was a job. And he did them pretty well. I mean, he was really great. And even after knowing him so well and knowing his style, whatever that was, so well, having heard so many of his scores, he could still throw surprises. I mean, I remember sitting in the booth listening to Mort's scores and going, where'd that come? Oh, that's Mort. That's just Mort. Oh, wow, listen to that. I mean, he had such a peculiar way of inventing things. You know, it was very emotional the way he wrote, very emotional. He was never very academic. He knew something about that, but, it, but he had a completely different way of coming to a score than, let's say, Jerry Goldsmith or, or um, I don't know, somebody else, you know, or let's say John Williams, or even Mancini. And seeing the way Mancini wrote was very different from Mort and all this. So that, all that stuff kind of goes into whatever my style is, I hope, plus whatever else I'm pulling out. You know, I think that a person's style is basically, and I mean basically, basically metabolism. I think it's the internal engine the way you phrase, the way you stack chords, the way you, you pick this chord over that chord, how long you sit on that chord, the kind of melody you write. I think it has to do with the stuff that's actually coursing through your body. The, um, yeah, it's, I think it's metabolism. So when you listen to a composer, you're really listening to a composer, you know, literally. There's a presumption made there, though, that something's going on externally that allows that person to express that style and not be just an amalgamation or a combination of other things. You know, I'm, I'm talking specifically about, you know, composers you hear that uh, it just sounds rehashed or it sounds unoriginal or oh, it no, sounds... That's, that's different. No, that's different. Because in, in a commercial medium, look, we all, we're all doing work for hire. Mm -hmm. We're just working on demand. And if I mean, this has happened to me, a director says, you know, I, I think the melody should go up and not down. So you go, eh, okay, so you make the melody go up and you make it work musically somehow, you know. Or um, there are too many chords there, or, or I don't like trombones. Or whatever. You know, you make changes based upon what the needs are of the film or what the demands are of the job, literally. But in the actual process of composing, I think you'd probably find that um, composers write from their interior rhythms. I, I, to, to pick a and this isn't making any sort of criticism or, or evaluation of anybody. If you pick someone like um, Danny Elfman and pick his style, whatever that is, uh, with someone like um, James Horner, okay? Very different styles, very different ways. Now, it's not, that, it's not that James couldn't write like Danny Elfman or Danny Elfman couldn't write like James if somebody said, I want this, and, you know, and, they, and if, if they wanted to do that, they could probably do things that, you know, sounded similar. But... Their styles are just different, you know, the, the way they come to things are just very different. I mean, Danny has this very energetic kind of nervous thing that he does and lots of energy. And uh, he can write quietly, but that's him. I sometimes say the difference between um, Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams is a fourth. But I would say the same thing about Wagner and Brahms. You know, is one a better composer than the other? You know, I have my preferences and you have your preferences, but in the way that they write music, it's just the way they get to their material is, is a certain way. Not that they couldn't change it because they were both very creative and, and here I am naming names, I'm not supposed to do that. But. <laughs>
favorite score? Of the two. Silverado or Tombstone. Um, and I only say you, you have to pick one because they're, you could argue that they're so different that it's hard to choose, but because they're westerns. I wouldn't put either one of them down as my favorite score, but Tombstone has a certain over-the-top thing. You know, I, I told you what I got from, from um, Mort Stevens, his Hawaii Five-0 over-the-top melodrama. And I just pulled all that stuff out for Tombstone because there wasn't, there wasn't a hole deep enough that you couldn't try and fill. You know, when I f saw Tombstone the first time, they had tracked it with Silverado. And um, they only had half the film ready. So George, the director, came out and he says, Do you like my music? I said, I love your music. Hate it in this movie. Makes your movie look stupid. I didn't say that to him, but it did. It made the movie look stupid. And I thought, oh, this is going to be a lousy movie. Um, once they took the sound, once they took the temp track away, and I could just work on Tombstone, it was a lot more fun. It was so dark and so grim and so entertaining and so over the top. It's like my kind of music, you know? I mean, it's just, okay, so I say I want to have a low end, so I'll have trombones. Oh, I'll have a contra -trom contra bass trombone. Oh, I'll have a contra bass cerusophone. That'll, you know, it sounds like a, car, a cow in heat. I mean, I, I really get entertained watching Tombstone. I can sit there and I don't even laugh. I just think, oh, this is really fun. You know? If someone put a gun to my head and said, which one? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I like Tombstone. I like Silverado for a different reason. I, I like Silverado not because I don't think I like it for the reasons everybody else likes it. The one thing I like about Silverado that I don't have much of an opportunity to put out in my other music and hardly anybody has in the 20th century is that it has a great sense of joy. And at the end, when I, I remember when I was working on the end credit and I got to the corral at the end, I thought, Oh, this is going to be so cool. This is going to be so cool. And it has that great ending. And it just makes you feel great. And like how much music in the 20th century makes you feel great? Like nothing, you know, not, I mean, not like that, you know. So I like Silverado for that. I like, I like Silverado because it makes me feel good. Um, I like Tombstone because it just makes me feel everything else. You know, it's just out there. Was Silverado the biggest orchestra you'd worked with at that time? Um, no. Uh, I'd done a TV show in um, in England. I'd done a TV movie, the first Olympics, where we ended up having less music than they thought. So I convinced the producer to hire a bigger orchestra. So we had, well, it was about the same. It was, I think I had about 65 guys, so Silverado was maybe a little bit bigger. But Silverado wasn't a huge orchestra. It wasn't overly budgeted. And young Sherlock Holmes wasn't overly budgeted either. They were pretty, you know, pretty stinko on their budget. It's funny, though. Thinking about styles and the difference in styles, when we were doing Silverado, it was a year ago or so, remixing it for this last <laughs> final album, um, I brought my scores to go through. And I, I'd forgotten some of the music because I don't listen to it a lot. And, and of course, you know, the latest version, they have everything in it, even the source music I and mean, everything, you know, everything you don't want anybody to hear is in there. So I've got the scores sitting there and we're playing all this stuff back and I'm looking at the scores and thinking, oh, that's pretty cool, that's pretty slick, I'd forgotten that, oh, that works really neat, you know, that's, oh, that's I'm patting myself on the back. And then I thought, if I were to write this score today, I wouldn't write this score because there'd be no way I could show it on a synth. That score was written with all my imagination going, you know. I mean, I'd written at the piano. I know where the flutes are in the piano. I know where the violins are. They're right there, and this sounds like this. And then, oh, I think, right here, I think I'm going to try this. I mean, oh, this ought to be kind of, and you get that excitement in it. On the synth, you have to demo it for somebody. It'd be a lot simpler. Silverado would never have existed. And I, I think about that in terms of scores. I don't know, I mean, guys who, who are used to working with synths and working with electronics can probably get that kind of excitement in other ways. But orchestrally, I think that that's, that's gone, you know, because you, you can't get that kind of inventiveness. I, I know several talented guys who are working who do features and who do television. You can hear their talent because you can hear the moves they make and you can just hear that they've got something, you know? But I wonder what they're gonna be doing in five years because I know that these guys are working under more duress than I ever did when I was doing what they're doing. Um, 
look, I mean, like when I was doing, when I was doing Hawaii Five O, which is a long time ago, it's 35 years ago. I used to go in a projection room, look at the show, we'd spot the show, and then I would be given notes. I wasn't given a tape. We didn't have video. I certainly wasn't given a DVD because we didn't have any sort of digital media. We didn't work on computers. I was given notes. The music editor had worked out all the timings. And I would sit there and I'd look at the notes and I'd remember the cuts. I'd remember the feeling of the scene. So I would write from that. I wouldn't check to see how many frames was there between that. I mean, I just, I just remembered. So I would write these things that would be one. And then I would worry. And then I'd get to the recording and I'd put the music up on the screen and go, Oh, oh, that's cool. That works great, you know. But I, there wouldn't have been any test. When I did um, Silverado, which was, what, 20 years ago or something, uh, I had video. And I think I used the Oracle for some timing, widely. But basically everything was written with a pencil out of piano. And Larry Kazan, the director, uh, wanted to hear some stuff. I said, yeah, sure, come over, I'll, I'll, play, I'll play what I got. So he came over, his brother came over, the editor came over. The editor, Carol Little, Littleton, was a uh, musician. So, you know, she had some background, but Larry's not a musician. Certainly his brother wasn't. So they came over and they sat in my room, and I sat there and I played the score on the piano. This is going to be, you know. And they were very polite. Oh, no, oh, that's nice, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they didn't have a clue as what they were hearing. Who could? And then a couple of weeks later, we get on the scoring stage, and it's wham, you know. And suddenly, that was Silverado. The stuff before that was just somebody pinkling on the piano, you know. So there was a lot of faith that Larry had in that particular thing. A lot of the directors had and a lot of the producers had that you would come in with something. And they got surprised. They might know what the tune was, but they didn't know what the score was. Now they have to know everything. And now the director says or the producer says, I don't think that's going to work, you know. So you start making changes based upon the way your mock-up goes. Well, your mock-up may not be very good. Your mock-up certainly is not the orchestra. And some guys have better samples and certain better abilities than others. It's the end result that really matters. But by the time they hear the end result, there are no surprises. And it's not exactly a great situation to be in because when you go to... Um, see, I, I feel like when you're doing a film or when you're doing any sort of music, there ought to be some sense of standing there with your pants around your knees, you know, just feeling the breeze and going, ah, this is uncomfortable. You have to be a little uncomfortable. And when the director says to you, yeah, it's great, except right there, I'd like such and such, or, oh my God, that's so big. I don't, that's way too big, or oh, that's not big enough. Or now you've got 80 guys sitting out there. What are you going to do? You get funky. You know, you start making changes. You go, oh, okay, I've got them right here. It's like one time, a few years ago, I was working on, um, I even remember the movie, uh, So I Married an Axe Murderer. It was, a, it was a nice picture. It was a fun picture to do. Um, the director was great, Tommy Schlamme. He was a nice man. He was a great guy to work for. I mean, everybody, everything on it was just great. But I got to one spot on the scoring session, and uh, he walked out and he said, that's not what you said you were going to do. I said, it's not? He says, no, you said you were going to do a jazz thing, and it was going to be such a, you know, what I had just done was definitely not a jazz thing, you know. What are we going to do? I said, no, give me a few minutes. <laughs> so he, I mean, he didn't, he didn't start screaming or yelling or going, oh my God, oh my God, get rid of the, you know, we got, you know, he just kind of went away for a while and inverted or did whatever he had to do. And I sat there and tried to figure out how to get this thing around to what I apparently had said I was going to do. And then... 20 minutes later, he came back, he listened to it, and went, cool, great, okay, that's it, okay. Now, what was going on inside me? It's like, bum ba tum ba tum ba tum I mean, I was like, really nervous, Come on, can I make this work? Because I don't think I've got the right guys, and this is not what I intended to do, I thought, or, you know, whatever. There's all that anxiety. Working that way works for me, and it works for some other guys. I don't know that it works for everybody. I don't know that it works for John Paul. I mean, I talk to John about the way he records, and he likes to record the groups, and he's very careful. For one thing, he's a really good composer, and he really knows what he wants to hear, and he gets his groups, he wants to get the brass this way, he wants to get the strings this way, and, and he, can, he can do that and make it work for himself. I, I don't know that I could do it. Can you figure out why, I mean, or maybe he said it, because I, was, I heard the same thing, and, and it, I was trying to figure out why he would rather that, unless I, it was just a, a means of control after the fact. I think he likes the control. I think he likes having, I mean, 
the control. I think he likes having the control on the music because, um, again, in the old days, I mean, like in the really old days, everybody's mixing monaural tracks, and you have a choice of making it louder or softer, and that's about it. Then you've got multiple tracks, and so now you can take this track up or down, all that kind of stuff. Um, then it got to be, you know, when you had multiple tracks, like 16 tracks, 32 tracks, whatever, you can take the drum. Like I went to the dubbing stage one time and watched a director take out a whole bunch of Elmer Bernstein's score, you know. Okay, let's try it with just the bass. Ah, uh, that sounds lousy. Okay, let's try it with just the, what's that, the cellos? Let's take, you know, it was, so I'm watching Elmer's score go, oh, you know, like this. Okay, that's not so cool. So if you're going to go through that, why not prepare for it? Now, I know Elmer was not that. Elmer was uh, was a acoustic guy, so I know he hated that kind of stuff. He didn't want people screwing around with his music. Well, John knows the process. John comes from a very different background, and he's a younger guy, and so he wants the control over it, and, and when he gives the director the option, he wants to know what the options are. He wants to give as much as he possibly can. John's also pretty careful with sounds. You know, he um, He's real interested in recording this sound and that sound, and seeing what that's going to sound like and setting up, you know, I mean, he, he gives himself different options, things that he's interested in things that I wouldn't be particularly interested in, but I, when he talks about it, I think, oh, that's really cool. I think I'd like to find out about that. But, you know, it's, uh, in that way, I think the guys have very different styles. I think what he does, um, I think what he does is really interesting because um, he works with the samples, he works with the recording, however he does, and somewhere in there, he manages to write some pretty decent music. You know, he writes, like the first time I was really aware of one of his scores, I was listening to it and I thought, that's a really good line. There's a bassoon, that's a really good line. So who is this guy? That's a good, you know. I tell composers <coughs> or people, whenever I talk about film music, I say, look, we're not working in the music business. People who work in the music business are songwriters. We work in the film business. And what we do has nothing at all to do with music. It has to do with film, it has to do with drama. So if the director asks you to do something, and the directors aren't stupid, it's not like they're dumb guys. You know, if the director asks you to do something or a producer asks you to do something, he's basically talking in terms of film. Unfortunately, you're working in the medium of music, and it gets to be very confusing. And it gets to be very confusing for composers. I think that a lot of guys who, who could otherwise be really great composers or fine composers maybe not get, won't get that opportunity because the demands of the film have been presented in such a way uh, and the time constraints and the money and all that kind of stuff will preclude them from ever exploring what they could do as composers. So, you know, when you ask me, do you, do you know any young composers who are working now who are going to be great in five or six years? I don't know. I know a bunch of guys who could be if they're left alone, but if they, if they keep getting fiddled with, I don't know, because the only way to become a really good composer is to write a lot and get a lot of experience and to try things out and to know that you did that badly and you know so let me try to get that's a great advantage of the TV series when I worked on Quincy Jerry Jerry Immel told me this years ago he says once you're the composer on a series they sort of leave you alone now I don't know whether that's still true or not because they know that you're going to turn in whatever you're going to turn in and you know they have confidence in you um, when I was working on Quincy I became the guy I did probably 65 percent 70 percent of the Quincy's that went on for all the years one week I turned in a score that they didn't like. And then nobody told me. I just happened to hear it from somebody. They didn't like your score. Like, oh. So I called the producer. I said, is that true? You didn't like the score last week? No, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I said, no, 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 no. What, what was it you didn't like about it? You know, what did I do? No, Bruce, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, but what did I... Uh, Bruce, we, we just figured, you know, you had a bad week. You'd, you'd be back next week. Okay. <laughs> you know, I still thought it was an okay score. I don't know what they didn't like, but you know, they didn't bump me from it. I was working on a, I was working on a movie years ago with Peter Himes, and Peter narrow margin. Narrow margin. Yeah, it was narrow margin. And there was no secret. There were a lot of problems on. There was a lot of disagreement between him and me. Okay, but he's the director, right? And I'd worked with him once before, and, and he had, you know, he had set out what he thought was the um, conditions under which he wanted the score and how he wanted the score, and I didn't pay as much attention as I should have. Anyway, we got to the point where I was having to change a lot of cues. And um, a couple of days into this, I looked at him and he was looking really unhappy or whatever. And I said, look, Peter, you know, you've got three choices here. You can either let me do what I'm doing, change the cues as they come up, or you can let me go home 
and rewrite the stuff, or you can hire somebody else. And boy, at that, he turned around to me and he pointed me and says, you screwed it up, you fix it. And I thought, well, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. That's a very workmanlike way of dealing with it, you know. It's your job, I gave you the job, you messed it up, now you fix it. I had enough confidence in you that you could do it. I've got enough confidence in you that you fix it. And so we worked it out. And he went away, as far as I know, happy, you know. And I, I never forgot that. I mean, I, I just thought, what a really cool attitude. It's hard. It's hard, you know, because he still wants it the way he wants it. But that was a really cool thing. And I'll tell you, in that way, film music is a really cool medium. Because these guys don't, don't let you slide with a pretty tune. You know, they don't let you slide with a pretty harmony or a cool voicing. You know, they're, they're right in your face sometimes. They go, hey, you know what? This doesn't work. You said you were going to do this. You didn't do that. So you do what you said you're going to do. You know, oh, okay. No. Now, can I do what I said I'm going to do? When I was at CBS, I heard lots of composers give promises. At the spotting session, they said, oh, yes, I can do such and such, and I can do so and so and so and so. <coughs> Only one guy, I remember, delivered on his promises. That was Jerry Fielding. Jerry would say, okay, I'm going to do such and such or so and so, and you get to the scoring stage, and, man, he was doing exactly what he said he was going to do, and... and no easy feat, you know. But other guys would sort of think, oh, they forgot, or I forgot, or... You know. Are you talking about a, a uh, in terms of the music that was written or the dramatic impact of the Anything, music? you know. I mean, just the director might say something, you know, in the heat of the moment, you go, oh, yeah, I can do a such and such and do a so-and-so, and you get home and you forget about it, and no big deal. But Jerry would remember, and Jerry would come back, and he'd do just what he said, and, and it was every bit as good as what he said it was going to be, you know. It was very cool. No, it's, but that's the cool thing about film. I mean, it makes you be very, very, very specific. So when you start to write your own music, and just for you, you get into those things like, you know, am I being sloppy here? Should I be my own director? Should I tell myself that's not good enough? You know, should I erase that bit? Should I be a little tighter? You know, it gives you a technique if you, if you want to use it for that. So this is the wine cellar, formally called. Still call it wine cellar. But in fact, it's actually the storage for all the scores and all my CDs and whatever stuff. I mean, Lisa's put everything together and, and now I know where everything is because she's organized and I'm not. So we have like, um, you know, it's True Women, Boy You Could Fly, Cross My Heart, uh, Cinema Geek, Homeward Bound. And um, right now I've got young Sherlock Holmes out. So this is the original score, original sketch anyway. You can see how hard I worked on these. <sighs> About a week or so after I finished Silverado, I got a call uh, for an interview with Barry Levinson, who was doing Young Sherlock Holmes. To tell you the truth, I can't remember reading the script. I must have read the script, but I don't remember reading the script. But I remember Barry. And we talked, and um, Barry had just finished The Natural. Um, I think he had... That, I think Sherlock Holmes was probably his third movie, so he was basically just starting out. And I was eager to do some more stuff because I enjoyed Silverado, and I knew the Silverado was doing well in people's minds. So I said, well, why don't you talk to, to uh, Larry Kasdan? He says, well, I've already talked to Larry Kasdan. <laughs> you know? Anyway, so Barry, um, for whatever reason, decided to hire me. So I got this movie, but there was no time to work on it. There was only like, like four weeks, and there was a pile of music in it. In those days, we didn't normally put 85 minutes of music into a score, and I just finished 75 on Silverado and thought I was going to die. The difference between the two films, for me, musically, was that Silverado was in some ways disappointing in that I had been there, done that, in that I had done a lot of westerns. You know, I hadn't done a movie. I mean, that way it was very exciting. And also, Silverado was the kind of music that sort of had to be stand-up and powerful and, and just like this, you know. So I wrote the music in terms of structure and, and sonority and all that kind of stuff. Had a lot of, and it had a lot of excitement in it because eh, it was my first movie. I was excited. So I got to Sherlock Holmes, and here's this movie about this very bright kid, and it's very intricate, and there are all these sub-themes going on, and everything is going by like this. I mean, there's no scene that lasts hardly. You know, I mean, it's like an animated movie. It just runs, 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 runs. So I thought, oh, this is really cool. I can use all the intricate stuff that I couldn't use on Silverado. Um, not that I took anything from the drawer, but I just, oh, it's a style that I, you know, I can really have a good time with. I wrote um, what I consider to be the marching theme, that dee da 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 dee da da which is the Sherlock Holmes theme. And then I wrote what I thought, what I always called the investigating theme, his deductive theme. Dee-da-da-dum, doo-dum, doo-da-dee-dee, you know. 
And I wrote a piano version for both of them, because that's all I had. And Barry came over, and Mark Johnson, the producer, and I played the tunes for them, you know. So I remember I played the, the Sherlock Holmes theme, and I stupidly said, so what do you think? Do you like the tune? Yeah. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> like, eh. <laughs> I don't like that bit there, you know. I had I'd put a few more notes in. I don't like that bit there. And, and other than that, it was kind of like, if that's what you're going to do, do it, you know. I mean, I don't know whether he went away thinking, oh, God, we don't have time to change this guy or whatever. I don't know what it was. But anyway, it was, it was friendly, but he wasn't overly excited, you know. I also learned something by doing that, that nobody can tell the value of anything the first time they hear it. You just can't. Uh, I mean, it's not a story against him, because actually he really likes music, and he's a very musical guy. Um, what I learned later in subsequent pictures was play the theme twice. On the second time, start to talk. And the third time, they can hear it, you know. But it takes about three listenings to get used to it. On the piano, it's really hard because all the notes sound the same. And um, you just don't know. And to figure out what it's going to sound like in the Yorkshire, it's impossible. Impossible. It's impossible for me, too. I mean, if, if John Williams sat down at the piano, he's a good pianist. If you sat down at the piano and said, here's my theme for such and such or so and so, I go, oh, that's nice. You know, play it a couple of times. Let me hear the hook. Let the hook. I mean, they call it a hook because it has to, you know. And the first time through, very little hooks you. And if it does hook you the first time through, it's probably a lousy tune because that means you're going to hear it and you're going to get tired of it, yeah. you know. So you want to get a tune that's that's interesting but not too interesting or that's not too dull. That's just enough that's going to sustain the thing. So I spent the next several weeks working on this thing and thought I was going to die. Because it was real. I mean, it was really a hard job. It was big. You know, I had all these different styles in it, and I ended up writing like seven or eight different kind of themes and sub themes and motivic stuff. And and when I was finished, literally, I thought it was just like chopsticks because I'd been hearing it at the piano the whole time, day and night. And I was really tired, so I got on the plane, slept on the plane, and I remember uh, Kurt Silva was my music editor. He sat with me, and, and so we talked until I passed out. We got to London. And uh, Mark Johnson picked us up, and I'm smiling and I'm talking to Mark. Yes, it would be very exciting. And inside, I'm thinking, I'm done. I'm over. This is it. This is the end of my career <laughs> because this music sucks. This is going no. It just sounds like chopsticks. It just you know. got to Abbey Road. Had the orchestra out there. England at that time was a rather chauvinistic place. They didn't have too many women. They had three in the orchestra. They had a harpist, a flute player, and a violinist somewhere in the section. I looked down the violin section and I said to the contractor, "Who's that?" He looked down, he says, oh, that's Belinda. I went, oh, Belinda. Twenty years later, I married her. Um, <laughs> so that worked out well. Um, so, so I get up and I'm here thinking, you know, that the world is going to end. Let's put up Q, whatever it was, start doing it. Man, it sounded great. And I'm thinking, oh, maybe I won't die. Maybe, oh, maybe it's going to be. I turned to at Kurt and Kurt's excited, you know, because he really gets into the films. I went, I think this is going to be okay. He goes, yeah, yeah. You know. So it just went on like that for like four or five days, however long we had to record. I mean, every piece was just great. I mean, it was just so much fun. I mean, I was dead tired, you know, but it was just great. At one point, I played the theme in some big version. And Barry Levinson comes out and he says, oh, God, is that, that's great. What is that? What is that? I said, well, that's the main theme. He said, yeah, but are we going to hear that again? I said, and I wanted to say, that's the tune you didn't like on the piano, you know. Like, you know, shut up, Bruce. So he said, yeah, I said, yeah, we're going to hear it. Oh, ah, ah, ah. Okay, so even that was going well. And they were happy. I was happy. When it was all over, they gave me an extra week in London just because they were so thrilled, you know. And I was thrilled because it was, it was the most fun I'd ever had recording anything because not only was the experience fun, and I saw that girl in the violin section, um, but because musically it was a big surprise to me. I just didn't expect it to be that rich. The thing about the movie was it was really well made. It was really well edited. It was really well directed and it was really well acted. And it's one of the few movies that I've done that I can look back on now and really enjoy watching. It um, was very opulent. Uh, visually it was really interesting. The story was interesting. I mean everything about it was just very cool and it gave me all this opportunity musically to do all sorts of things, you know. So. And they didn't bury the music in the oh, oh, and that's the other thing. They didn't bury the music. And I've said to people, of the people, of the films that people like of mine, like Silverado, Young Sherlock Holmes, Tombstone, um, 
Miracle on 34, excuse me, whatever they are, for the most part, they're scores that you can hear. When you can hear the score, people tend to like them. You know, when they can't hear the score, people said, oh, yeah, I remember that movie. Did you do that? Uh, uh, you know. And I've seen things on TV going, well, excuse me, where's the music? You know. But on those things, the music was actually played up. It wasn't overplayed. Oh, and then we got to the dubbing. I went to the dubbing. And um, Steven Spielberg was there. So he was listening to it, and he said to Barry, you know, I really like this score. I really like this music. And Barry said, well, that's Bruce. <laughs> Meet Bruce. And so he looks at me and goes, I really like this music. You know. When it was obvious that the film wasn't going to do, do well, Barry said, geez, you know, maybe it's true. You just shouldn't have the name Sherlock Holmes in a movie title <laughs> you know, because Sherlock Holmes movies never do well. Um, I've heard other people say that the problem with the movie was the Temple of Doom stuff, which I think is probably the weakest aspect of the film. I mean, it was sort of like been there, done that, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I was talking earlier about all the Henza stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, here's all the notation for that, some of the weird stuff during the um, cemetery. No, the thing about Young Sherlock Holmes for me was that it was just, it, it, it fit what I did. Is the main title there that you can, like, the, all the Colenio uh, stuff and the... The main title, I thought it was a really cool movie. I thought it was a really fun project. It was really rich. I could write all this big music. I could write all this kind of symphonic stuff, and I could really explore the orchestra and do all sorts. I mean, we'd had, like, the, the styles go everywhere from Elgar to Penderecki. You know, I mean, it's just we have everything in there. And um, Mark McKenzie was my orchestrator. He was, it was the first job he'd ever worked on. So we spent a lot of time on how we were going to notate certain things, you know, so we're looking at scores of Henza and Ligeti and all these guys, you know, trying to figure out how are we just going to write this to get this sound out. Oh, here, yeah. That's, that's it right there. It's just tapping on the body. Tap, tap body with knuckles. Tap on the body with knuckles, yeah. <laughs> so that's the main title. As I said earlier, Basil and I were in school at the same time. We were both at USC at the same time. He was a, I think, a cinema co composition major. So I never met him. I had a roommate when I was at SC who was a cinema major, and he would tell me about this guy, George Lucas. And I remember seeing George on campus because George, um, Basil, um, God, I mean, there were a ton of guys. Who Emilius, right? Went through that year. Who? Yes, yeah, Emilius. Yeah, yeah, I mean, all these guys. I mean, they all were there. In the concert world, Michael Tilson Thomas was a year ahead of me. Ralph Grissom, the keyboard player, the pianist, was there at school. You know, we were all there together. I didn't hang out with any of them, you know. Didn't do me any good. But anyway, they, there they all are. And I've known some of them since then. But Basil I met at CBS. It was, um, it was 1970. It had to be 1976 because it was for the CBS Bicentennial. CBS had this little shtick. They were going to do Bicentennial Minutes, these little... Reminders that would say, This is our bicentennial and celebrate America and blah, 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 blah. Okay. It turned out that Mort Stevens ended up doing it. Big surprise. But Basil was there. Basil somehow had a contact with the producer and was trying to get that job. So he came in the music department. We met each other and we're talking. And he said, um, You did some student films when you were at SC, right? I went, yeah, I did. He said, You did Poem of Rodia. I said, Yeah, good memory. He said, I remember the tune. And he sang me my theme. This is like 10 years later. And I well, that's kind of cool, you know. Well, you met Basil, like what's not to like? I mean, Basil was like, he was great. He was just a really lovely guy. I had no ability to hire anybody because that was not my function. So I got him a partial score. Unfortunately, I had to do it with a reduced orchestra, so we only had like 13 or 14 players. And it was really a gnarly job, and it was really unfair, but it was the only way I could possibly double talk to get him in, you know, to do anything at all. Um, and I don't know that he didn't hold it against me for years later because he said, that was really hard, you know, I needed more players, and I said, which he did. But it was a way of me trying to get something with having no ability to hire anybody to push him in just by fast talking to get this kid, you know, a job. So, uh, I mean, another guy I met was uh, Dick De Benedictus, who used to do a lot of television. Dick showed up in the room one time, he was there to spot a show, and I don't know, I saw him a couple, a couple of times, and it was like, haven't we been friends before? I mean, like, let's be friends for, you know, so we used to hang out all the time. He helped me when I went to Universal. He got me onto, a, onto um, the Oregon Trail, the series that he was working on but had to leave. So he said, you come on to the show, you do, the, you do half the episode, and then I'm taking off, you do the rest of the series, because I'm sure it'll work out fine. So that's exactly what happened. I came on, I did 30 
percent, or I did rather 30 minutes or something of the show. Dick took off to something else. I stayed on uh, Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail went to the toilet. But I was there long enough so that Harry Garfield could hear what I was doing on Quincy and offered me Quincy to do, you know. So, I mean, it worked out great. So in that way, we were actually helping each other get work. You know, I was trying to get Basil work. Dick was helping. And then later on, I'd try to get Dick, you know, whatever it was. Now, I don't know whether you can do that so easily. There was more work then. And it was not just one guy on a series. Like when we did Hawaii Five-0, we had six or seven guys who were on. Um, Gunsmoke was the same way. There were composers who were assigned to the show, but sometimes we'd bring in somebody else, and I would get assigned. Like I did a, I did an episode of Heart to Heart. That was a Mark Snow show, and it was a really uncomfortable thing for me to do. But Mark wasn't available one week or something, you know, so I stepped in there. Well, there was no way in the world I was going to be successful up to the up past the point of just being appropriate because it was Mark's home turf, you know. But I did the show, and then he came on and he finished it off, and and. Um, that was sort of the way it was. When I started, a spotting session happened in a theater. You'd walk into a room. You wouldn't sit in front of a, a, a chem or a, um, a moviola. You'd actually go into a theater, a projection room. You'd run the show, and then you'd run it a second time and go through the spotting session. So you had people all around you. It was just for the composer. It wasn't for the sound effects, it wasn't for the dialogue, it wasn't for anything else, it was just the composer, the music editor, whoever else is in, the producer. I haven't done that for years. Um, now you look at it, you go to somebody's house and you look at it, and, and the director says, I want it there, and I want it there, and I want it there, or sometimes they just send you the video and, and with some notes, and then you figure it out yourself. You know, even the music editors aren't always with you the way it was, so it, it, socially it's a very different group. I remember going to MGM one day to spot a show and meeting Jerry Emmel, who was leaving, you know. He was coming out from a job, I was going to a job. So you'd see each other on the, on the parking lot. Well, now you don't even make the trip. You just stay at home and wait for the phone call. And a lot of guys, um, I think a lot of guys have a series, and they're the guy for the series, and that's it. But they get, they get their jobs by phone calls. It's not that much of... Um, Camaraderie. How would you say that's affecting the music? I'll program the Difficult um, to say, but how would you I'd, hypothesize? Well, for, for one thing, music, music everywhere has changed. Um, the songs have changed. Concert music has changed. Film music has changed. Um, you know, like I was talking to Al Silvestri the other day uh, on the phone, and, and we were talking about this, um, how things are cyclical, you know. And as he said, he says, you know, it may come back, it may not. And that's sort of the way it is. I mean, things go back and forth. And, and I've seen this for 30, 40 years. But music is, like right now, melodies are not popular. You know? And you can hardly find anybody who can write a melody. You know, it's not popular. Um, harmony isn't particularly big, but they like little gestures and little sounds and things. One of the things, of course, that's changed music in, entirely has been the availability of synthetic music, of being able to do it at home. And the home studio has changed things a lot. And a lot of people who don't have a really substantial music education or much music education at all can at least make music. And so you find some very primitive things. Like I heard a film a year or two ago that I thought sounded like it came out of somebody's garage. And I talked to my agent about it. Turned out it was one of his clients. He says, so I said, well, obviously they didn't have much of a budget. And he says, no, actually they had a lot of budget. I said, you mean that was intentional? And he says, well, yes, it's a certain kind of a style. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, obviously I didn't know about that. Um, I think when we were all working with orchestras that um, we had each other more available and if we would help each other out, um, there was just more of a sense of community. And I think before us, there was even a bigger sense of community because before me, there was the, um, the studio staff. John Debney and I were talking, to drop names, John and I were talking a couple of months ago about the way Disney was. We were talking about um, Buddy Baker. And he said the buddy used to come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, suit and tie, and he'd leave around 5, and he would have written that much music. You know, and the next day he'd come in again, have his coffee, and leave, and wrote that much more music, you know. Uh, it's not like that anymore. For one thing, people don't even write music anymore. They just sort of program it, you know, they put it in. Um, I remember being met at the door at 6 o'clock in the morning, having written all the way through the night, by the copyist who was picking up my scores for a session that was supposed to start two hours later, and I still wasn't done yet. 
well, no way a copyist is going to come to my door now. I just email them the scores. I think that when you get a chance to actually listen to music on a scoring stage and you listen to how other people actually construct the sounds and how they change the sounds, particularly if, if you have the advantage of working with somebody who has a terrific orchestral gift like a Jerry Goldsmith or, or somebody who is a, a wonderful arranger like Mancini, someone like that, or, or Michelle Legrand who can take your breath away, um, you learn stuff you know, and you pick up stuff. You steal stuff, you know. And we would steal stuff from each other. I mean, not tunes, but you go, oh, that's a good idea. I want to try that out. Like, I remember hearing something of Jerry's one time in a film, Coma. I heard, I, heard, I was real taken with the score, and I bought the soundtrack, and there was this one device that I, I was trying to figure out how to do that. I couldn't figure out how he did it. But I knew he had an orchestra of basically strings and, I think, six clarinets. So I thought, okay, it has something to do with clarinets. I can hear that. So I tried every score I had, I'd try, if I had clarinets, I'd try to get that device, you know. And finally I figured it out, after like four or five tries, I finally figured it out. It had to do with E-flat clarinets. And boy, the day I got it, I felt really great. I thought, oh, okay, I, I know how he did it, you know, it's obvious. I mean, why didn't I think of that before? Several years later, I saw the score to Coma. So I looked up that section. He didn't do it like that at all. <laughs> he did it with synthesizers, you know. But in the meantime... What was it exactly that you He had were... done something with a, it was like a, this little funny sound up high with, with, it sounded like clarinets doing a, this little squeal, you know, thing. Um, but he had done it on a, I think on an ARP 2600 or something, you know, it was entirely a synthetic thing. But the process got me to learn something about how to write for clarinets, you know. And that's the kind of stuff that you want. Now, what, you know, you sort of listen to it and go, oh, what a cool sample. I wonder how he got that. Um, or, you, oh, I, I've got the same sound. Oh, that's interesting how he has it. Oh, he uses the same library I do. Or I've heard those horns. Oh, it's got the same clam as I have, you know. I used to get really excited by hearing scores. And I, I don't want this to be taken wrong, but I used to go to movies and get really excited by scores. Like one of the guys who's working on my house right now, we were talking this morning about the James Bond movies. He called, he didn't call them the James Bond movies, he called them the, uh, the Goldfinger movies or something, but I, he was some of the James Bond movies. He said, all those early, all that, he said, they had music that was so... It was so neat. I used to just love that music. I said, well, yeah, it's John Barry. You know, I mean, everybody loved that, you know. Okay, this is a guy who's building my house, and he's talking about scores from, what, 35 years ago? I remember scores from 35 years ago. I remember scores from, I remember scores that were so exciting, I could hardly wait to get home and try something out myself or just go buy the, buy the album and listen to it. It's been a while since I've done that. In the last couple of years, um, as features in television have not been as plentiful as they were at one time, it seems like a composer's options are, do you cry about what there isn't, or do you look around for what there is that you haven't looked into yet? And for me, I enjoy doing motion pictures, and I, like, I enjoy doing film, but I like to write music. So the whole time, whether I'm working on a, on a film thing or whether I'm not working on a film thing, I'm always working on something. So. Um, if I find myself doing more, let's say, concert music or let's say things for bands or for special commissions or something like that, I have to go back to that original purpose of what it was that I was writing about anyway, that I want to involve people. I want people to feel something. I want them to be able to listen to the music, to enjoy it. I don't want to write down. I don't want to pander. Um, I want to write well. I want to write better. I want to learn how to do the things that I don't know how to do. And I'd say over the last couple of years, that's sort of what I've been focusing on up to this point. Vote that, Roosevelt. <laughs> yeah, that's so great. That is really all over the place, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. The 5-4 beginning kind of sets you off, and then the 2-4 really throws you. Yeah. And then it goes into 4, going, oh, and then all this, the 6-4. Look, when you're working in the movies, and you live in Hollywood, that can be mistaken for your life. I mean, you know, Hollywood is the, the life. Well, you get on a plane and you travel somewhere else and, and you see, oh, not necessarily, you know, it's fun. Like we're going to, um, we were in Spain last year, we're going to go again this year at the, the Ubuda uh, Music Festival. Well, that's great because you get in contact with a bunch of music fans who are European. They're not American. They're a little bit different than the guys. But they really know the music. They really like the music. They're very respectful, they're very warm, um, they're very intelligent, 
And it's like, the problem is what? And also you get to be in Spain, that's okay, you know? But that's just the way it came out. You know, what I tried to do is just, I just tried to write a melody. And, and then, then however it divided up, it was how yeah, divided I tried up. not to rush it, and so I just figured, okay, the bar line goes here, and it goes here, and this note needs to hold a little longer, so that's gonna make the bar line go over there. I can tell you that at, at this point in time, I've gone back to remind myself of what it was that made me become a composer and what it was I wanted to do. And now I'm real comfortable, I mean, I'm real comfortable with what I'm doing. At the moment, I'm spending more time writing concert music than I am writing film music. This weekend, I'm working for my son-in-law, who's doing a, um, he's, tr he's developing an animated show for kids. Um, so I'm doing the music for him. It's kind of weird working for your son-in-law, you know. He said, he, he sends me an email the other day and he said, I'm leaving for New York on Tuesday. When am, when am I going to be able to hear something? <laughs> I'm thinking, you know. oh, and so I caught him back. Okay, well, I'll have something ready for you Sunday night. You know, and it's like, you know, it's, it's weird. But, um, but it's, it's a cool thing because I know him and I happen to know the little kids because he has three little kids and my other daughter has two other little kids. And I, I know the age group and I know his sensibility, so it's a cool thing. Um, so I'm happy doing that. I'm going to be working with a... Uh, Spanish guy who's doing a, a student film over at SC. Happy to do that too. They happen to like young Sherlock Holmes over there. It'll be budget bound, which means creatively it's going to be a problem. That's good. You know, it'll make it interesting. He's enthusiastic. I'm enthusiastic. That's okay. So that's my film thing this, this week or this month. Next month could be something else. Could be I'll be working on my orchestral commission, you know, because I've got a bunch of commissions lined up. Um, those aren't a piece of cake either, because even then, you know, if somebody's going to shell out some money for you to write a piece, you, know, you don't want it to be a loss of their money. On the other hand, you don't want to write down and, you know, pander. So the whole thing becomes like a composing problem. If I'm working on film or working on a TV thing or a video thing or working on a concert thing or just working, like in a couple of weeks, my wife's going to premiere a violin sonata I did. Okay, that'll be listened to by about 200 people and probably make me a dollar ninety-eight. you know, in the, but... But I get to try out some things on that piece that I couldn't do with the director. So it, the whole thing is a good deal, you know. I'm real comfortable with all of it. Um, what I'm not comfortable with is working on things that aren't fun for um, in abusive situations or things where the music never becomes the point. Um, working with people that I really just don't seem to get on with. Um, not that that happens very often. For the most part, I've been able to work with a lot of really fun people. I would say right now things are pretty interesting. They're pretty interesting and um, they feel good. I'm writing a lot of music, looking at a lot of different styles, listening to a lot of music. Um, things aren't bad at all, you know. comes out of a pencil, you know, or it used to anyway, <laughs> now it comes out of a circuit board. <laughs> it's not the life that I would have figured I was going to have, you know, 40 years ago, it's sure a lot more interesting.